Good morning. I am Glenda Carr, president and co-founder of Higher Heights Leadership Fund, and thank you for joining us at the National Press Club here in D.C. for those who are in the room and to those who are following and watching via live stream. We're so excited this, uh, this morning to release uh, our latest report with our research partner, Center for American Women and Politics. We have been doing this report since 2014. Higher Heights is the political home for black women, a place for black women to be informed, engage, and to take action to build the collective political power of black women from the voting booth to elected office. So when we first partnered with the Center for American Women in Politics, we wanted to explore black women's political representation in the American democracy. You can't determine where we are going to go as black women in elected leadership if we don't know where we've been and where we currently are. So since 2014, we've made some major leaps as black women in elected representation, but we also will share today with our researcher, Dr. Kelly Dittmar, places where there's tremendous opportunities for elected women, elected leadership for black women. And that comes with uh, the fact that we have opportunities and barriers. So in 2014, when we first partnered and released our first status of black women in American politics, there was only one black woman serving as mayor of a top 100 city. We now have eight. Congress had 14 black women and two delegates, totaling 16 black women serving on the Hill. And at that time, there was a zero black woman in the US Senate. We now have 26 black women serving in Congress. Um, that includes two non-voting delegates, but we're right back at zero black women in the US Senate. But we gained a black woman in the White House. Uh, status uh, as relates to statewide executive offices, that is where there's tremendous opportunities for black women. Uh, we, in 2014, there were two black women serving in statewide executive offices. Uh, Denise Napier, who's the treasurer of my home state, Connecticut, and then Attorney General Kamala Harris in California. We now have six. We've still never elected a black woman governor. And where uh, our researcher, Dr. Dittmar, will share a little bit, a bit more about state legislatures across this country, you'll see we're moving in the right direction, but there's work to be done. And that's the work of Higher Heights. How are we going to accelerate 10 years in the making? Black women just didn't wake up in 2020 ready to lead. We've been leading, and we've been the architects to this democracy since Saturna Truth proudly stood and proclaim, ain't I a woman? And so this report and this research is the basis to the blueprint to ensure that black women's representation exists at every level of government. I'm so excited to um, introduce our partner and our researcher, Kelly Dittmar. She's an associate pro um, professor of political science at Rutgers University, Ca um, Camden Plaza, Camden Plaza I'm in Brooklyn. <laughs> um, can always be in Brooklyn, even if I'm in That's DC. Right. Uh, <laughs> Take the girl. And she is uh, the director of research um, at, and scholar at the Center for American Women in Politics at the Ingleton Institute of Politics. Please welcome Dr. Kelly Dittmar. Thank you, Glenda. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I look forward to doing these reports always um, with Higher Heights. And, and as Glenda mentioned, I mean, this is seven years. For the past seven years, we've been doing these reports um, to track the status of black women in American politics. And I'm going to repeat some of the points that Glenda made, because I think they merit repeating um, and give us a sense of where we've been. Um, so if you'll change the slide. Um, since our first report in June 2014, we have seen 16 new black women elected to Congress, including the second black woman to ever serve at, in the US Senate, as Glenda noted, and the first black women to represent their states from Connecticut, Delaware, Massachusetts, Missouri, Minnesota, New Jersey, Utah, and Washington. In that time, if you'll change the slide, the number of black women state legislators has also risen by nearly 50% and change the slide again. Um, and black women have also made tremendous strides in representation as big city mayors, with 12 black women um, taking office for the first time as mayors in the top 100 most populous cities, it's a mouthful, um, 
from mid-2014 when we first did the report, and um, as Glinda noted, we only had one woman in that position, um, to eight today in cities like Atlanta, Boston, Charlotte, Chicago, New Orleans, San Francisco, St. Louis, and Washington, D.C., with prospects for that number to grow soon. And of course, with Kamala Harris's election as vice president, a black woman now sits in the second highest position in US government. But black women's gains in representation, of course, um, shouldn't mask the persistent hurdles uh, that they found, to, they found in navigating um, towards electoral success. So I think today's panel discussion provides an opportunity to take these numbers and then interrogate those hurdles in a bit more detail. Um, and we see, I think, our reports as providing necessary context for that sort of conversation and that work that comes from it. Um, the reports highlight the details of and the sites for black women's underrepresentation, allowing for discussion about where that underrepresentation exists, why it matters, and what we can do to change it. So now I'll get to some of the stats that this report um, focuses on. So the report we released today shows that first, um, a slide, Despite being 7.8% of the population, black women are less than 5% of office holders elected to statewide executive offices, Congress, and state legislatures. A record number of black women ran for and won congressional offices in the last election in 2020, but black women's congressional representation is not currently at a record high due to the departures of uh, Kamala Harris and Marsha Fudge. Between 2020 and 2021, black women's state legislative representation also increased. We saw those gains, but it didn't increase as much as it did in the 2018 election. And you all can sort of know part of the reasons why, but I will say it's important to mention party divisions here. Um, so in a year where Republicans and Republican women fared particularly well in comparison to other years, um, black women's success remained concentrated in the Democratic Party. Today, no black, woman, black Republican woman serves in Congress or in statewide executive office, and just three black Republican women serve in, as state legislators nationwide. Still, um, in 2021, black women did reach a record high in state legis legislative representation. We're actually one down from that high um, today, uh, but those numbers change on a pretty regular basis. So we did reach that high this year. Um, change the slide, please. Black women also, as Glinda noted, remain severely underrepresented as officeholders at the statewide executive level. Right? There are 310 of these positions nationwide. Black women hold just 1.9% of them. And I always like to point out this, um, just 17 black women have ever held statewide elected executive offices. And as I note here, 216 men currently hold those positions. Um, and no black woman, of course, has ever been elected governor, despite the first ever major party uh, nomination of a black woman for governor in 2018. Um, and as was mentioned before, we currently have no black women in the Senate. So even where numbers have increased, there's still this opportunity and really vast opportunity for growth in the number of black women running and winning at all levels of office. And the 2021 and 2022 elections offer immediate occasion for us to see black women both harness their political power at the ballot box, as they have always done, um, as voters, but also on the ballot as candidates. So in less than two weeks, elections in New Jersey and Virginia will be held that offer some opportunities for gains, including the election of the first black woman lieutenant governor of Virginia. That major party contest is between Democrat Hala Ayala, who is Afro-Latina, and Republican Winsome Sears. Um, there are also special congressional elections to watch. If you could change the slide. Sorry, I think I'm like three back. <laughs> change the slide again. <laughs> Um, and one more. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, it, there are also special uh, congressional elections, two black women, Chantel Brown and Laverne Gore, who will compete on November 2nd to fill Secretary Fudge's seat in Ohio's 11th congressional district. And a victory for either woman will increase the number of black women in Congress to 25 voting members, uh, in addition to the delegates. And the percentage of, of black women in Congress would go up to 4.7%. And the total number of black women to ever serve in Congress will increase from the current 47 to 48. Um, there are also three black women running in the special election in Florida's 20th congressional district in the primaries on November 2nd, um, with the general election in January. Uh, change the slide, please. 
We're also watching mayoral contests nationwide, including black women on general election ballots on November 2nd in cities like Buffalo, uh, New York, Durham, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, and St. Paul, Minnesota. And those are just in the largest cities, right? So there are other races to watch, of course, nationwide. Black women will continue to seek big city mayoral posts in 20, 2022, including uh, in Los Angeles, probably most notably thus far, with Karen Bass's decision to uh, run for mayor there. Uh, slide, please. Um, 2022 offer, also offers opportunities to address the acute underrepresentation of black women in the Senate and um, in, in statewide elective office, but particularly as governor. So we've already, we're very close to, um, already exceeded the record for the number of uh, black women running for the Senate, at least those who have announced already. Um, and slide. We are likely to exceed the record number for black women running for governor. We're at five announced candidacies, but uh, the record is six. And there's a few women, including Stacey Abrams, who haven't officially announced candidacies. And that might happen, maybe, possibly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, one more slide. Um, and finally, in congressional and other statewide executive contests, a lot of this is still in the works, right? So we don't have the numbers, but with announcements happening every day. And I just want to note one that didn't even make it into the report because it's happening every day. Um, representative, State Representative Summer Lee in Pennsylvania joined two other black women who are sitting legislators, Attica Scott and Michelle Rayner, in launching congressional bids for open seats um, for 2022. So, this is just a start. Um, there's obviously more detail in the report, but I just want to note too and sort of end on the note that while our, our report focuses on numbers, we know that progress for black women in elective office isn't measured in numbers alone. It's measured in the effects of having black women at the table, at policymaking tables and in these institutions to be disruptive of not only the institutions themselves, but the policy agendas and outcomes that we see that come out of them. We know this from our research, from research from many of my colleagues who have demonstrated this to be true, but it's also evident as we watch black women office holders in action every day. And I'm sure that we'll be provided with a lot of examples and context for that in this panel. And so I'm looking forward to the discussion and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Kelly, for walking us through Black Women Lead by the Numbers. Uh, I'm so excited uh, about this panel, um, not only going to be able to respond to this data, but also an analysis about black women current Lee um, elected and what we need to do to expand our elected leadership. Our moderator this morning is Nicole Killian. She is the congressional correspondent for CBS News in Washington, and she reports across all the CBS platforms <laughs> and broadcasts, and she played a pivotal role in reporting during the 2020 political election season. So please welcome Nicole. Thank you, Glenda. Uh, and really, thank you to all who are joining us in person and to those of you out there who are joining us virtually. And I really just want to say that it's an honor to be with this esteemed group of women, but particularly Glenda and Kelly, who have been instrumental uh, in, in my own reporting on this issue, both in the 2018 midterms as well as the 2020 election. They both have been tremendous to have resources. And as you can see by the report put out today, uh, a well wealth of information uh, that can be gleaned as we look ahead to 2022. So with that, I will introduce the rest of our panel, uh, which includes uh, to my left, your right, uh, Ashanti Golar, who is sitting in the middle. Uh, she is the president of Emerge. Sonia Ross, who is the founder and editor-in-chief of Black Women Unmuted. And to the end of our table is Mignon Moore, who is a principal with Dewey Square Group, better known as one of the colored girls. <laughs> uh, always and forever. And uh, for those who don't know, you know, Google it, buy the book. <laughs> um, but I want to thank, I, I thank everybody who's with us today. And of course, we've got Glinda and uh, Kelly, who introduced themselves earlier. Uh, and I really just want to start with a, a question to all of the panelists. You know, I think as uh, Glinda and Kelly noted, you know, certainly black women have made many strides in politics, but there's still uh, quite a ways to go. And so I want to know, what does this moment mean for black women? 
I guess I'm going to kick us off. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Ashanti Gaur, the president of Emerge. One of the things that I always say is this really isn't a moment, it's a movement. Mm -hmm. And Higher Heights is a big part of this movement. We know that black women, we are key voters. But for the past few years, we have really been taking our power from the ballot box to actually putting our name on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So everything that we're seeing this is how it's supposed to be. But when we really put it in bigger context, we know a few years ago, we celebrated you know, the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. Mm -hmm. But that did not guarantee access for all women. That guaranteed access for some women. So we know, especially for black women, it's really been since 1965 and after that we have been able to really focus on holding electoral power. So this is why I say it's a movement, because from Shirley Chisholm on, black women continue to see, own, and really harness our political power. And that is happening at the state level. We're seeing it happen at the federal level. So don't ever think that this is going to stop. You're just going to continue <laughs> to see more and more black women running despite the barriers that are presented to us because black women are electable. If black women weren't electable, we wouldn't have black women in elected office. Um, I'd say that, um, number one, it means everything to us. Mm -hmm. If you've been in the game long enough, you know how far we've come, and it isn't really a quantum leap for us. Uh, it, it's gained in intensity. Uh, black women's political and civic engagement and participation has always been there beneath the radar mm -hmm. flying low which is i suppose how the society likes it mm -hmm. but the thing with us now is that water we've been dripping on the rock of in mm -hmm. intersectionality is now starting to break through so of course people pay attention when something that seismic happens but it is not um, any kind of quantum leap we've been here the whole time undergirding American democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the foot soldiers during the civil rights movement. I mean, I know that everyone loves to look at the pictures of all the, all the preachers in suits, <laughs> locking <laughs> arms, and talking about how they're sitting out, let, let my people go. Um, mm -hmm. But behind them, if you've ever looked at any of the historical pictures, and maybe you should, you know, mm -hmm. um, we were there in the masses making the change happen. So I'm glad America's paying attention, and I'm glad that uh, people in elective office especially can see us for the influences that we've already always been, and I just hope people will keep watching because in 2022, they're gonna get this work. At least that's what everybody's telling me. You know. <laughs> And Mignana, I want you to jump in here too, just by talking about your own personal experiences, but also how does intersectionality impact black women in politics? You know, I, if I can, I want to go back just a little bit to uh, add on to what uh, Ashanti and Sonia said. First of all, I actually saw the shift, really saw the shift in 2016 when Hillary lost. And when black women understood that they showed up at the ballot box for a white woman, not a black woman, they showed up for a black woman, and our counterparts did not. And I know I sat around many tables, Glenda was a part of them, Ashanti was a part of them. We kept asking ourselves the question, why do we keep showing up for other people? Why aren't we showing up for ourselves? And, that, and so I will flip this and say, I thank God for people like Glenda, and Sonia, who's been on the playing field as long as I have, but she's just been doing incredible work around this issue. And Ashanti, because they put a spotlight on this. They said, okay, black women, it is your time. We can't keep showing up. We have as many issues on the table as the next person has. And so why aren't we showing up for ourselves? So we began, we began to really mobilize and think about our vote strategically, thus we have a, a vice president in the White House. That was very deliberate. That wasn't like we just showed up and decided that, okay, we want a black woman. We strategized about that because we understood that in 220, we could not afford to have black women keep showing up and they saw no receipts. Mm -hmm. 
And so we, we were intentional about it. So we were intentional about, we, we still build allies, we still show up for other people, but more and more we show up for ourselves. And we're, we're demanding that people show up for us. You know, every time I look around, they're asking for our vote, but what are we getting? So now we're saying, okay, we're running, so you're voting for us too. And so that, those are some of the shifts that I've seen in how we think. It's not how we show up, it's how we think, and I'm, I'm happy to see it. And I want to direct this to you, Kelly, uh, and Glenda in particular, as we all have noted, Shirley Chisholm was the first black woman elected to Congress in 1968. Since then, 47 black women have served in Congress from 21 states. However, only 5% of black women are in elected offices. And obviously, that's a pretty small number. So Kelly, I want you to kind of speak about some of the dynamics behind that. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we've been able to do in just as Glenda noted in, in spotlighting the numbers, is then get into the conversations of why. And mm -hmm. folks, including some research we've done at the center, but also a lot of scholars and the organizations on the ground doing this work can point to the hurdles that black women in particular have faced. And they're, they're multiple, right? So there are the, the baseline cultural stereotypes and expectations that create different terrain for black women who are navigating this space. And I think, you know, the work Emerge does and Higher Heights is doing to help train women and say, this is what you're going to face. These are the questions you're going to face that might be different. Um, there's also financial challenges that we've seen. We've seen disparities in the willingness to really invest and give black women candidates the money they need to be successful. Um, and we see that across the board with women, but particularly acute um, with black women. And so again, the work that's being done to, to fuel the financial uh, infrastructure to support black women is key. But then also on the piece that I think both Minyan and uh, everybody on this panel has mentioned, Ashanti is doing day to day as well, is we've seen black women who've been on the front lines of every movement on doing the political work say it's our turn and we're going to run and so there's been a translation of i'm going to take this advocacy and activism and translate it into candidacy um, and so it behooves all of us to then support and show up for those women who decide to put their names forward as candidates. And that's been a real shift in 18 and 20, and I think we're going to see it in 2022, of the black women who are running and winning who have been here all along, but now said, no, we need that seat at the formal table of, of politics. And I guess, Glenda and Ashanti, if you can kind of speak to some of the work that your organizations are, are doing around this and what you believe has to change to increase the number of black women in elected office. I'm going to speak to um, the culture shift. So over the last 10 years, um, the work of organizations, the work of black women um, have been helping to shift the narrative around what leadership looks like. Um, it is our greatest opportunity in the growth we've done, but it's also still the greatest barrier. Mm -hmm. um, you still don't hear, we don't wake up and say, candidate A, white man, is <laughs> not electable mm -hmm. or viable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those are code words mm -hmm. for women of color in particular. And when you start shaping the doubt around electability, that slows down all the other barriers uh, Kelly just talked about. Mm -hmm. If you don't think um, candidate um, B, uh, a qual overqualified black woman, uh, is not electable or viable, it slows down her money, it slows down her media coverage, mm -hmm. it slows but down her instit institutional support. So the work at Higher Heights uh, and our partners over the last 10 years has been making creating the environment for black women to run, win, and lead. Uh, and with that environment, uh, in addition to, I'm sure Ashanti is going to talk about the training piece, when you create that environment, you create the possibilities where black women can run and win. And so the report points to that there's more women running in districts that are majority white districts and running like an, a Lauren Underwood who represents a district that is 3%. It's a rural suburban district in Illinois. Certainly, if a white man can represent me, <laughs> and has been since my birth, that we need to have in America to, to um, recognize that leadership, our leadership transcends our race, mm -hmm. our ethnicity, our gender, um, and that our lived experiences um, are a benefit add to our elected leadership. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when I took over Emerge in 2020, I had to create 
our next vision and our plan. And we were celebrating 15 years and I wanted to go big and bold and just create a 15 year plan. And when I looked at what the country was going to look like in 2035, 2045, it was just very evident that we were going to be a multiracial, multi-ethnic country. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to center the new American majority. And when you look at that, black women are a very key part. And I do that framing because if we want more black women running for office, you have to be serious about it. Mm -hmm. You have to make the commitment. You just can't be saying, oh, it would be great to have more women run. It would be great to train mm -hmm. more women. How is it fundamentally centered in the work of your organization mm -hmm. and to have that commitment? So that's what we did at Emerge with having our Emerge 2035 plan and wanting to reach 100,000 women of the new American majority with a significant number of them being black women. But there's also the other part to this of when we've been talking about the numbers and we need more black women mm -hmm. running and we have more black women running for higher office, we need to have that conversation as well, that black women do not have to bloom where they're planted when they get elected to office, mm -hmm. that we want for them to ascend and reach higher. And that's why it's important that we're having these conversations and focusing on doing that recruitment and training as well. Yes, we want for you to run for higher office, but the piece of that that follows is being very strategic about recruiting another black woman to replace them mm -hmm. for the seat that they are vacating. Right. Because if we don't, then we lose progress. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest about it. This is what the old boys do all the time. Uh -huh. And we uh -huh. say at Emerge, they got the old boys club, we're building a new girls network. <laughs> if y'all can like yeah. whisper, oh, I, I'm gonna be term limited, or I'm gonna run for this, or I'm not gonna run again, Ladies, let's do the exact same thing <laughs> that's right. and like get our sisters in the pipeline and ready to run. And that's a key piece of the recruitment and the training and the amplification. We just got to beat the boys at the game that they play. Mm -hmm. Can I just real quick say one other thing? It just reminded me, Ashanti, when women get in office, they need the support mm -hmm. so that they want to stay. And I think when we're talking about why some black women may not have run before, because these institutions are unfriendly yeah. right. and they're hostile outright hostile, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, I think of Ayanna Presley, Representative Ayanna Presley, standing on the floor of the U.S. Congress saying, you know, patriarchy is at home in this institution. Mm -hmm. And the abuse that, that they face both in office, from constituents. So again, there's a responsibility on society, not on those women to do better on these institutions to do better so that they want to stick around and they want to enter them in the first place. So and I, know, I guess speaking of this society's responsibility, can we talk about the media for a second? <laughs> <laughs> because parallel to this entire process of black women becoming more interested in engaging politically and socially in this country, there is also burgeoning um, enthusiasm among young black women mm -hmm. to go into media and cover it mm -hmm. and talk about that and make those subjects um, forefront to the movement in this country toward becoming a, a nation that does not have any race as a single majority. Mm -hmm. Well, our friends in the media are very active participants mm -hmm. in perpetuating a narrative that holds us back. Mm -hmm. um, in, in terms of coverage, the ideas tend to get dismissed. A lot of stories get murdered in the womb. Mm -hmm. Let's be real. Uh, any journalist in here who's ever had a conversation with their editor and the editor goes, well, I just don't think that's a story, mm -hmm. can relate to what I'm talking about. And if the but, media but do you can think get that, do you there. Do think that's changing, though, from the standpoint of, especially after all that we witnessed last year, I mean, there does seem to be a greater emphasis on people of color we have seen some newsrooms starting to even change their policies uh, yes. around that. So do you think that could then make a difference as we look ahead to this next cycle? Yes, it can. And here's how it can. Why don't um, media organizations apply the same enthusiasm to what black women are doing right now to the, the, apply it in the same way that they applied it when they first saw the Tea Party coming along, mm -hmm. uh, when they first started talking about Republican revolutions. Is like back in the early 90s, we, mm -hmm. there was this whole discussion of that, about the nature of quote unquote soccer moms and how they vote. Pay that same enthusiasm to this movement among black women 
it did get attention, and notably so in 2017, I believe it was, when 98% uh, exit polls showed 98% of black women voters in Alabama helped to lift Doug Jones into the U.S. Senate from Alabama. Mm -hmm. But what didn't get reported with the same enthusiasm are the 70 black women who followed that election and ran for office in Alabama, uh, which had not elected black women on that type of scale and, and really didn't in 2018. But those women didn't go anywhere. They didn't go away. So let the media thundering herd go to Alabama and report that type of enthusiasm out. Give us the same credibility that you gave to the Tea Party and to the Trump um, folks and MAGA people as they began to emerge. You see, we've been out here as black women um, for more than five years now at the same level of enthusiasm and it's intensifying. So we deserve that, that focus from the media. You know, can I just add one other piece to it? And I've, I've actually been trying to study this a little bit because I think images are part of what, what Sonia is actually referencing because we are, black women are portrayed in so many different ways. And public service to me is the one way that we're not portrayed. I can almost assure you that most people do not even know how many members of Congress we have or how many legislators we have or how many mayors we have because we don't think that these jobs are important until they are important. And so even trying to train the media, not just to see black women, but to see public service as a noble calling and a, and a place that people would want to come to to is very difficult because in, it, this is where the media has really lost its way. The images that they project, especially with black women, are so skewed and so off the charts sometimes until when you wake up and say, okay, Kamala Harris is vice president, they're like, well, what the hell does that mean? I mean, what does she do? So what is the first thing they ask? What is her portfolio? So they compare her, so they, they automatically construct her to the last 48 or however many VPs that were white men, <laughs> God bless them, and then they don't know that yes, she does have her traditional duties, but she also has a playbook in history. That's right, yeah. And nobody, you know, so they won't even give her that, the luxury to say, okay, she is she has a duality she faced. And black women face that duality every day when we walk out the door. You know, you think black men have it bad. Just just let a black woman step up. We either we're angry mm -hmm. or we're, you know, we're just, you know, we're as Reagan painted us, welfare queens. So we still have all that baggage to unpack so that they can see how precious these women are when they leave their households and they leave their children to go serve this Congress or go be a mayor or to be a state legislator. We give up a lot. I mean, we get up a, give up an awful lot. And so I think the media can help us project the wholeness and the humanity in which we serve. I, I want to get back to this issue of uh, the pipeline, mm -hmm. um, which many of you also raised because mm -hmm. I actually, as long as I've covered politics, <laughs> and certainly not as long as Sonia, but <laughs> I was really stunned by the fact that there are, has never been a black mm -hmm. woman elected governor. I mean, stun, mm -hmm. stunned by that, really. Um, yeah. And so yeah. if you can drill down on that issue in particular, uh, uh, you know, is there a sufficient pipeline to recruit successful candidates? Maybe Glenda or Ashanti. I don't know if I'm you gonna, want to take that. I'm going to frame and, and toss it to Ashanti. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because when you talk about, we actually have ex, um, amazing examples of when the pipeline works, mm -hmm. right? Kamala Harris ran mm -hmm. one governed on the city level mm -hmm. as a DA, um, ran one and governed statewide executive as attorney general, ran one and served as a U.S. Senator and is now in the executive office. Um, Tish James, Letitia, um, mm -hmm. look at me and all like, my, Tish, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> New York <laughs> Attorney General Letitia York Tish James, <laughs> a staffer yes. mm -hmm. of a state legislator mm -hmm. who ran, who used opportunities. Like each opportunity she has currently um, taken on was an open seat because of a special election. Ran one in a special election city council. Ran one in a special election um, state citywide office. 
ran one in a special for statewide executive office and there's talks about a possible another move for her, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are, and those are just two examples, um, far west mm -hmm. and the northeast. Um, I, many of the congressional members, the women of the CBC, Mm -hmm. held local election elected offices they come from civic organizations mm -hmm. and nonprofits um, and so there is a pipeline there and and the question is how do we duplicate that mm -hmm. I mean the the household name is the blueprint that Stacey Abrams yes. um, provided right here is a woman who was a tax attorney I mean a tax accountant mm -hmm. um, or attorney tax um, tax <laughs> attorney uh, <laughs> tax attorney um, run and ran as a state legislator, mm -hmm. minority leader, <laughs> ran for governor, um, and what she decides next, you know, I'm in. Uh, <laughs> um, but actually is now leading at a level that we can't even comprehend right. that her political right. brand yes, right. changes elections across the yes. country mm -hmm. from the local level already to the national office. And so those are the blueprints. Mm -hmm. um, now the question is how do we connect the dots with the strategies? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll, I'll let um, Ashanti yeah. touch upon that. So as Glenda said, the women are absolutely there. Mm -hmm. We have the pipeline. But what we have to do is think about this in the context of the many ways that black women can repower political structures, mm -hmm. which is the third piece of our MERS 2035 <laughs> plan. So we know we want women running for office, winning, but we also have to think about the fact that black women candidates need great campaign staff. Mm -hmm. They need great activists. There's also a role for black women there. We're seeing the importance of these boards and commissions, especially mm -hmm. those that are focusing on equity and justice issues, criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. We need black women on those. It's also going back to the staffer role. And it's like we know for a lot of black women, when they start to work in an elected office for a black woman, that also gives them the bug, mm -hmm. you know, to think about what their role is in running for higher office. Mm -hmm. So we have this pipeline because we have black women in all of those positions, but we know that we can always use more. So it's the bigger context of the way that black women can repower political structures. And we are there at all levels, and we just have to continue to talk about it. Yes, it absolutely is running for office, but we know the pipeline doesn't always have to be self-selecting or I have to hold this office first before mm -hmm. I can do everything. I tell black women, the minute you wake up, you are qualified to run for office. Hello. You are qualified <laughs> to do all the things. Like there was a man who just woke up one day, said, never run for office. All I've done is married and divorced a whole bunch of women, bankrupted some companies. I get to be president. <laughs> no. Black women, you are qualified to run for office. I think, too, everybody on this panel has played a role, I'm, I'm taking myself out of this, but in party <laughs> politics of, of intervening in the conversations mm -hmm. that are often blocks to the pipeline. So mm -hmm. the pipeline can be there, but if then you get to the table and you say, I'm running, and the white male party leader says, you're not electable. Right. We're not gonna fund you. We don't think that this is a viable candidacy. We have somebody else. Um, then that's where the pipeline gets right uh, blocked up. And so, so you can do all the work in this end. So I just wanna sort of reemphasize the importance of black women at so many tables mm -hmm. throughout the process. So it's not just running, as Ashanti said, it's staff. It's being in the face of party leaders. Um, right. It's making sure that that you try to prevent those blocks in the in the pipeline and also push back against the electability concerns, particularly when we're talking about governor. Um, it goes back to these electability concerns that black women couldn't possibly win a majority white electorate. Well, we know that's wrong, right? Like we just, we know from evidence that that's incorrect, um, that surely they can and they should, but it's a perpetual bias that, that still is there and needs to be confronted. And, I would just and add, you add we the just polling to that, yeah. which yeah. if anybody in this room believes in the polling, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, there's, there's this, they can't raise the money, they, they, they don't have the poll numbers. I mean, truly the poll numbers should never be discussed in any political campaign. Mm -hmm. Right. And, mm -hmm. and and how do those poll numbers get to be that way? Because media organizations <laughs> conduct the polls. <laughs> and when they partner up mm -hmm. to do this polling, 
Polling is very expensive, and this is just a realistic problem for the media, more so than a racial attitude problem. Mm -hmm. It costs a ton of money to do polls that are oversampled enough to get enough yeah. mm -hmm. minority representation to shape the opinions. Mm -hmm. But it, but only if, if, if only media would just say, well, you know what, we're going to cough up that extra money to get at these opinions, they wouldn't find themselves getting surprised on election day when surprise, surprise, so-and-so won. <laughs> that, that unelectable lady won. Mm -hmm. We find ourselves balancing mm -hmm. that, that act. How, how, my God, how could we have been covering this all this time and never seen this coming? We've never mm -hmm. seen this coming. Well, you would see it coming if you add oversampling on a regular basis to the polling. Mm -hmm. And I want to well, just well, tie that together <laughs> because I do think Congresswoman Ayanna Presley said it best, you can't poll transformation. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. That's right. And so I'm going to talk about some polling that Higher Heights has done. <laughs> <laughs> That had an appro really appropriate, appropriate and, sampling of right, an electorate right. of, of women uh, <laughs> that we did in 2020. And, uh, we did uh, <laughs> women in 2020, and we just recently did women in Virginia because there was obviously a black woman at the top of, you know, not at the top of the ticket, but part of the uh, top of the. Uh, <laughs> um, and then we also had two black women um, running for governor in Virginia. So two real examples for voters to, to respond to. And with the research pointed to that we did with Cornell Boucher and Karen Finney at um, Brilliant Coroners is that this electorate, particularly women, mm -hmm. are looking for the next generation of leaders mm -hmm. that are coalition builders. Um, and they believe that that is a woman, a woman of color, and particularly mm -hmm. that a black woman, um, and that, that they have a desire uh, and an interest in seeing black women on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And I guess just to build on that, and I think anybody on the panel can weigh in, you know, when we talk about transformation and, and you know, the ascendancy of Kamala Harris to the vice president that obviously left that vacancy in the Senate. Mm -hmm. And so there are no black women in the Senate right now. So, uh, you know, Glenda, I would want you to start off maybe by jumping in in terms of the current crop of candidates that are out there and if you will if you think that there will be at least one black woman or black women in the Senate mm. come 2023. Yeah, we are certainly poised for 2022 to have black women not only shatter glass ceilings, but to have multiple black women. I mean, I think if we go back and looked at the strategy that we started back in uh, 2012 and 2014 when we literally met with many of the women on this panel, uh, the, the founders of Higher Heights, was would we have navigated a little different in recognizing that we were excited about Kamala Harris being elected to the Senate 24 years after mm -hmm. Carol Mosley brought, it took 24 years mm -hmm. between the two black women that the acceleration of saying we should never just be happy with breaking a glass ceiling, gotcha. that the work is actually about the possibilities of how many. Um, and that's our work moving forward. We're, we're not a 15-year strategy, Ashanti. We're just doing a 10-year. <laughs> <laughs> so we had done a, a 2020 strategy we now are looking at. Let's sit at 2030 and imagine a democracy backwards. Mm -hmm. And so what 2022 does to set that up is in 2030, I imagine that there are five black women governors, right? And we've already shown by the women that have stepped off the sidelines in, in, in 2022 that they're in the Midwest, they're in the Deep South, they're in the Northeast, they're frankly in New England, mm -hmm. which is where I'm from. Um, there's five or six black women in the U.S. Senate, and those women are, are coming from different backgrounds, but they're certainly ascending from Congress. My 2030 is an ascension of, because of retirement um, mm -hmm. or other openings that there are black women poised in the current current Congressional Black Caucus to um, ascend to U.S. Senate. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll highlight one example. Um, Delaware, people don't know there's only one mm -hmm. Congressional member in Delaware. We got all, <laughs> there's two. I mean, there, it's proportional everywhere else. Delaware got one, uh, and that um, con that congressional uh, <laughs> that congressional member is a black woman who already runs statewide. Mm -hmm. So she sits at a poise to be run for another statewide office. May That's it be right. governor or U.S. senator. Mm -hmm. So the 2030 map. It is about building a strategy 
and ch moving chess pieces around. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, I mean, there's great opportunity in the Deep South, but to have a black woman that's declared for the second time to run for a statewide office in Iowa, yeah, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That shows the possibilities where black women can run across this country. And you know, I'm sorry, one ahead. thing I would like to, and I've, I'm not trying to take over the moderator's role, I just want to ask the question, though, about young black women and how we see them positioned to, to either enter this field. Is there things that we're doing that we could do more of? Because the truth is, it won't be about us. It will be about these young people that are sitting around the table. And are we doing enough to encourage them to get in this process and to get in the game, even at the most basic level? We see how the school boards are being disrupted right now over critical race theory. So, you know, I wonder if we need to do a little bit more to say to young black women and young, young men, hey, it's your time. Come on out. Well, I, I want you to expand on that, though, yeah. a little bit, Mignon, because you have worked very closely with the vice president. And I think from right. that standpoint, talk about what role you think she may play in that, but more specifically, what role you see her playing in the upcoming midterms. Well, she's probably, well, first of all, I think she's probably gonna be used quite a bit because she is kind of that generational candidate and they'll probably put her out and I'm hoping that in doing so, it will spark a plug and a vision in some young people to say, you know, if she can do it, so can I get on the playing field. But more importantly, I hope it shows them that her visual shows them that the power of their vote makes things happen. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, when we walk in the room, black women know a couple of things. At least this is what I say to young people all the time. I know I'm black, I know I'm female, but what I don't, what you don't know about me is what do I have? What, what receipts can I bring? And so hopefully by the time she gets out there in 2022, they will know what she's accomplished. A lot of her work has been behind the scenes and people always ask the question, well, where's the vice president? What is she doing? But I can assure you, and I'm sure Glenda and Ashanti and others can say that where she is moving the needle, it's for people that look like you and it's people that look like us. She is completely dedicated to making sure that communities that are left out can be brought into this process. So I think that she'll be a major factor in 2022 and hopefully a bridge to that new generation of folks. Because, I mean, that's really, um, I think it's key to any election too. I mean, I really do. And I know we have uh, some questions online, which we'll get to in a second, um, but I do want to expand the conversation as well with uh, Sonia. Uh, you know, talk to me too about the role that redistricting is playing in all of this and if there is any concern that black women could get squeezed out as we watch this process mm -hmm. play out across the country well redistricting always has that yes. dilemma every mm -hmm. time that's right so it, it it gets down to not prioritizing that and build and calibrating expectations according to that gerrymandering is just a way of life uh, especially at the state level and what is happening in a lot of places, especially in the Deep South, the longstanding habit of packing districts uh, and bleaching the districts around it uh, mm -hmm. are, is becoming more difficult because the, the suburbs and, and rural areas are browning. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the um, traditionally conservative white politicians are going to find themselves having to answer to a browner constituency no matter how they gerrymander a district or, or reconfigure the boundaries. So it's incumbent upon black women to ignore that mm -hmm. and stop calibrating our expectations according to the way legislatures operate. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've had uh, black women elected in majority white districts, mm -hmm. so we can't make that a priority. We already battle as women this notion of readiness, right? Or, or, but we not only have to prove we're ready, we have to knock down the belief that America's not ready. Mm -hmm. there, there's always the statement, America's not ready for mm -hmm. this person or that person to ascend. Well, America's never ready. When was, <laughs> when was America ever ready? I mean, the very revolution that created America, they weren't ready for that. Uh, so American readiness or the receptiveness of the voting public just has to stop becoming such a major factor in whether or not someone will run in a district once the boundaries have been redrawn. 
And I do just want to remind our audience online that, again, we'll be taking questions momentarily. So if you have any questions, we suggest that you put that in the chat now so that we can get to those. Um, I also just want to touch on one uh, more issue besides just the candidates. I want to look at the issue of black women as a voting block, because as you know, mm -hmm. black women were the largest voting block in the 2020 election. A and I guess on this one, anybody can can weigh in, but, but what role do you see black women playing in the midterm? And more specifically, I guess this would be more on the Democratic side, if you can speak to where you see things standing, because obviously we've seen the president's approval rating slip. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been concerns about you know voting rights stalling and yeah. police reform collapsing. And if you think that will affect the enthusiasm level of black women, or is it a motivating factor to turn out again? Mm -hmm. yeah, I will uh, speak to um, the history of black women. Uh, it's the definition that Higher Heights is broadening, right? That political leaders are more than just elected leaders. Mm -hmm. My great grandmother was a political leader. She didn't know she was, mm -hmm. right? And here's a woman who didn't have access to the ballot until the end of her life. Black women organize not only themselves to the polls, oftentimes not being touched by a candidate consistently, or frankly, an elected official, not only do they, we're issue voters, so not only do we you know, um, do our research, we also then organize our house, our block, our church, mm -hmm. our sorority, and our union. And because we are issue voters, that we are, I think, approaching you know, 2020 not slightly different, which is I think we believe we're not where we could be given the, the, the makeup of Washington, mm -hmm. but we certainly aren't where we were before. And that if we want to move the needle forward, um, that our access, fighting for the access, the protection of the access to the ballot, and then uh, uh, bringing in and supporting elected leaders that will, you know, that we believe are at least a beginning of a governing partner, mm -hmm. that I think this politically toxic, racially divisive times in 2022 mm -hmm. is going to be a motivating factor. And then you add in that there's going to be a record number of black women running up and down the ballot, mm -hmm. that we're going to see ourselves um, on ballots, that I think if you couple that, you will still see that not only are we going to go to the polls, we're going to continue to organize um, um, our networks to the polls, but I think we are more vocal and particularly um, younger women, young, younger black women voters that we're going to call the question mm -hmm. um, publicly, privately, uh, as it relates to you want my vote, you're going to need to earn it 365 days of the year. You know, I would also add to, and I want to start off by just simply acknowledging, especially to those that are listening, that it's going to be tougher because we were in the wilderness for four years and we saw the hostility of what a government could do. So we were excited about this government and we were excited about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And I think that if we unpack some of what they have already done, we will know that this administration is different. But what I would argue for those that are contemplating not voting, don't believe that your vote doesn't matter on any level. Don't believe it does not matter because it does. And the, thing, the things that you don't see that a government does, those are the things you have to learn to vote for. It's not the big splashy legislation that you see, which is important. Because when she when she started rattling when she started rattling off you know the George Floyd bill the Voting Rights Bill all of those things are emotionally attached to who we are as a people, but we also want jobs, we want safer communities, we want our families and our we want Black women to be able to go back into the workforce for daycare. So there are pieces of legislation that are going that's moving through Congress right now. Had we not had a Joe Biden and a Kamala Harris, we would never see the light of day. And you know, I'm not one of these compromised black individuals because I fight like the next person. And I say we must continue to fight. We must continue to hold the people we elect accountable. You know, we could, you know, oftentimes we look at ourselves like we're a constituency. We are a voting block. That's what we're talking about here. Black women are a voting block. Black people are a voting block. And so they shouldn't be looking at us like we, we got some, some complaint in their office. 
we elect them for a reason. So I, I argue continue that fight because you'll get what you want if you stay in the game. We also have to manage expectations yes. around this notion of black women as super saviors. Yeah. Um, a, a, a large narrative came out after the presidential election last year and through the Georgia Senate runoff earlier this right. year that black women saved democracy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, we did. But you know what? <laughs> we are not super women mm -hmm. at, uh, that you can That's call right. up at, uh, according to your whims mm -hmm. to fix what you broke and to do it quickly. That's right. Um, because we move at, at a slower pace and a slower, more deliberate pace than that. So we got to manage that expectation that, oh, now the black women are engaged, everything's going to be all right, mm -hmm. everything's going to get fixed. Because if it doesn't fix according to what they believe mm -hmm. to be the successful fix, black women will get b blamed for the failure. Mm -hmm. and, and so managing that expectation is, is vital. Mm -hmm. And I guess just sticking along those lines, I mean, obviously, as many of you are, are, are well aware, when we look towards the midterms, history typically is not on the side of the party that's in power, the party that is in the White House. We know a record number, for instance, of Republican women brand, uh, for instance, in the last Congress. And, and so as we look on the other side of the aisle, I mean, do you see opportunities for black women there? Maybe I'll start off with you, Kelly. Yeah, I mean, we saw an increase. So the numbers, just to look at the raw numbers and the racial diversity of the women who were running in 2020, it was more racially and ethnically diverse, broadly speaking. Um, there were more black Republican women than in previous elections running, but many of them, well, all of them ultimately didn't make it all the way through, right? Um, and so it is incredibly difficult for even those black Republican women who are putting themselves forward to make it through not only a primary, but then a general election. And it gets to all sorts of stereotypes, expectations, et cetera, that they're confronting that are parallel to some of the Democratic women, but in this case hurts them more, right? Because they're dealing with an electorate that has very different views on race, very different views on gender. And when we talk about intersectionality, they're sitting at an intersection that provides, in that case, often, in, in the case of the Republican Party, often a disadvantage. Mm -hmm. um, and there is very little investment. The Republican Party leadership will talk about the diversity of candidates, and they touted it at the end of the election but they weren't recruiting those candidates. Um, and so that's one other thing to be careful about, both on the Democratic side and the Republican side, mm -hmm. which is the party leaders are gonna wanna take credit at the end of the day for like, look, we had the most diverse crop, we got all these women elected. Mm -hmm. And I think the receipts that everybody is talking about also means, did you invest in those women early? Did you recruit those women? Mm -hmm. Did you support them? Did you endorse them? All the things that they need to be successful because in many cases we're seeing black women success despite um, not having that early support. I think of like Johanna Hayes we were talking mm -hmm. about or somebody you know who wasn't backed by her party. Um, but still was successful. Uh, so that's a long way to say I think there's not a lot of work being done on the Republican side, so it'll be a persistent side of represent under and be, representation. And to be clear, on the Democratic side, there was an assertive push uh, around support of black women beyond the voting booth. Uh, there was an open letter um, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. sent to um, the then um, new um, uh, chair of the Democratic Party, Tom Perez, in 2017, from Black women elected, um, Black women leaders from across the country, mm -hmm. calling the question that you can't just invest in, um, well, invest in Black women voters 14 days before an election cycle, <laughs> uh, um, and then not um, invest in our leadership. And that's part. So we've seen in the last couple of years more Black women holding party leadership. Mm -hmm. Right, you've got Nakima Williams, um, the Democratic Party leader in Georgia, um, Robin Kelly, who was supposed to be here today. Uh, they had votes called, uh, and uh, the congressional member sends her uh, uh, regrets. Um, is now the party chair in Illinois, a Karen Carter Peterson, who's been the party chair in Lu um, Louisiana. Those are recent gains um, in 
um, party leadership. And, and frankly, we need to see that on, you know, if we want, black women are a political monolith. So black women are Democrats, they're Republicans, they're independents, um, they have no party affiliation, um, they're third party, um, um, third party members, third party members. And so if we want to see those parties really center the reflective democracy we supposedly all want to see, um, mm -hmm. then we need to see women of color and black women um, in all party leadership roles. It seems like we do have some questions online, so we want to go to that and also would remind those of you in the room if you have any questions, just feel free to step to the mic as well. Uh, but this, and again, I'll, I'll leave this open to anyone. Uh, it says, I've been hearing more about the structural barriers that are built in our current system that automatically make it harder for black women to run and be elected. I'd love to hear more about systemic barriers and potential systemic solutions we can advocate for. Mm -hmm. Who wants to take that? All right. I guess I'll start with that one. <laughs> I mean, just a little question. Of course, this is hard. Of course, black women running for office is hard. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we're all playing in a system that was not built for us. Mm -hmm. This system was built for white men who own land. They never anticipated women having the right to vote. They never anticipated people of color having the right to vote. So everything that we're doing is disrupting a system yeah. that never anticipated our participation. So of course, there are systematic barriers that we're still working towards to this day. I'll be honest, like with Emerge, people aren't happy when it was created. People aren't happy that we exist now. Mm -hmm. Who do they think they are telling women to run for office and giving them the skills and the tools and the resources the fact that we're telling women that they can just step up and lead. That's honestly one of the ways that we're breaking down the barriers. Mm -hmm. Fighting back against the gatekeepers is we are doing this. We are letting women know that you do have a place in this society. It's what all of us on this stage are doing every single day. So that's a key way mm -hmm. that we are starting to break down these barriers is pushing back against the old boys club, party leaders, gatekeepers to do this work. But it's really more on all of us as the individuals and the role that we're playing. That's why we've been talking so much about the support that black women need, not just to run for office, but also on their campaign when they're in elected office. So it's really a collective effort for us to break down these barriers. It's a reason why I know Mignon is big on this too, like higher heights, low dollar funding mm -hmm. for black women candidates. Like mm -hmm. those five, 10, $50 donations, those add up. And there are in this country, 1% billionaires, but then like 99% of us. If all of us are donating to these women mm -hmm. with our little donations, the billionaire class has nothing on us. Mm -hmm. We're able to fuel and power getting more women and black women in office. So I think that's my pretty much answer to that question is we're playing a system that wasn't built for us and the work that we do every day is us starting to break down those barriers. But it can't just be the organizations alone. This has to be a people-driven effort across the country. Uh, you know, I would also add, uh, and I want to go back to this point about money, you know, because we, we, we are now becoming actual givers to campaigns. But I think that whoever asked the question, I would argue that if there are campaigns in your community that you can get involved in, whether you're volunteering, whether you're actually giving low dollars, or whether, whether you're looking at organizations like Higher Heights and Emerge and Collective PAC and the National Participation for uh, Voter voter Participation, these organizations wake up every day trying to figure out how, how they can put more black people in the pipeline. So if you got $5 that you don't want to give to McDonald's, give it to Emerge or give it to Collective Pack. I mean, it really doesn't have, I mean, we have to lower the barrier to entry to politics. It doesn't have to be rocket science. You can do from your backyard, you can gather your own people and make sure that you are advocating for the candidates you like. I was just gonna say that I think, I don't think the division between systems and structures is, is 
is as broad as maybe the question made out, right? These mm-hmm. are these are one in the right. same. Yeah. So all the structural things that I think we're talking about, getting women at the right tables, mm-hmm. disrupting the conversations around electability, all of those I think are leading to systemic changes. Mm-hmm. But I would also add from what Sonia said, I think is so important. Um, the, the narratives around black women saving democracy, right? That's also coming from a lot of white people. <laughs> and so I think that it also means there's an accountability and a follow-up to say, mm-hmm. were you tweeting that? Were you writing that? Are you now giving mm-hmm. to, to black women candidates, right? So systemically, it's defining the problem. Mm-hmm. That's what I hope the report does, right? Here's mm-hmm. where the problem is. Mm-hmm. And now if you think it's a problem, yeah, tweet about it, that's great. But also do something about it. Mm-hmm. And that it, I think, isn't beholden on, as we've been saying, like the work that th- these organizations and hopefully COP is a part of that, you know, to, to mm-hmm. move the ball forward. Um, it can't only be these mm-hmm. organizations. It has to be everybody else who stood up at the moment and cheered, That's but right. now needs to sort of systemically commit yeah. to that type of change. Mm-hmm. It's surprising the difference mindset change can make yeah. because no amount of battling against mm-hmm. structural, rigid, institutional mm-hmm. uh, problems is going to work without a sea change in mentality. That's right. yeah. You know, there's this whole phrase that comes up during political seasons about the soft bigotry of low expectations. <laughs> and and it's actually more damaging than it sounds. You know, it, it sounds so genteel, you know. <laughs> it's like wrapping an AK-47 in a velvet blanket. <laughs> uh, because abandoning the notion mm. that people of color can't do yeah. something mm-hmm gets rid of all of those low expectations mm-hmm. and the structural barriers start to come down. That's right. So just abandon that mindset that a black person can't do this or a mm-hmm. black person can't win mm-hmm. and let the magic flow from there. Mm-hmm. Glenda, did you want to jump in on that? Sonia took mine. <laughs> I mean, you can't right. be the they There are there is well at blanket oh around you know, access, you know, different ways of access to the ballot, to um, campaign finance, um, to um, ranked choice voting, which. Um, you know, these systems are designed to be more inclusive, but at the end of the day, when you talk about systemic barriers or systemic solutions, if we don't talk about systemic racism, (laughs) then it doesn't matter if we build other systems, Mm -hmm. uh, if we don't actually try to deconstruct the, 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 the foundation of the other systems, which is racism. (laughs) I want to just reach out to the audience to see if there are any more questions in person or online. I I do want to just, while we're talking about systemic barriers, because I know, Sonia, you brought this up earlier in terms of, you know, mainstream media and, and coverage, but also talk about the impact of social media as well, I think, and the, and the role that that plays for candidates if you know maybe somebody doesn't have that traditional infrastructure or that name recognition, if that's helping to play a role in amplifying candidates, particularly black women candidates. Well, the beautiful thing about social media right now is that it operates so beautifully hand in glove Mm -hmm. with the emergence of digital media. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've got your traditional media outlets and and, uh, old gray ladies newspapers like the New York Times. I love you guys at the New York Times. Don't get mad at me. (laughs) Um, and, And major networks and this sort of thing. They do what they do. But digital media is Mm -hmm. a lot more flexible and it is a lot more hands-on for Mm -hmm. someone who is uh, oriented towards social media. So it's fine to bang your head against the brick walls and try to get your stories in your the story of your candidacy or your campaign or your issue at these big outlets. Mm -hmm. But if you work that landscape of digital media, online media, which is very focused, subject specific, Mm -hmm. and they pay attention, and they, because they're also online, uh, they are available, more available uh, than your traditional media are, and, and flexible. So 
stop worrying about that endorsement from the hometown big mm-hmm. newspaper and work those student media, uh, the independent media operatives who are out there, the folks who are digital every day, that's a bigger megaphone. Mm. And I also, you know, when we're talking about overcoming um, systemic barriers, obviously, again, going back to the vice president and the transformational moment that that set in our country, kind of as we wrap up here and look forward, um, this is more like a quick lightning round. <laughs> um, uh, but, but when do you think a black woman will become president of the United States? given how close we are in this moment. I'll just go down the line, your prediction, best prediction. I think there, we are uh, at, the, at the doorstep of electing the first woman, yes. woman of color and black woman when there is an opening um, yes. in that White House. <laughs> That's a nice way to say it. Yes. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, as soon as four years, as long as eight, possible. Yeah. Sooner than anybody would want to believe that that's whatever whatever number you might attach to that, <laughs> just subtract five years. <laughs> it's it's gonna be sooner than people mm-hmm. will, will yeah. want to believe, mm-hmm. and I say that based on the precedent of Barack Obama. Mm-hmm. That was sooner than anyone wanted to believe. Mm-hmm. So don't count it out and dismiss it as a possibility. It's a very real possibility. But rather than attach a year to it, just say it's going to be sooner than you think. It's kind of that mantra from the last election, right? She's electable if you vote for her. So Correct. I also think that's part of like the onus is on, on the public. All right. I'm just going to go with my sister here and say don't believe that it won't happen. Because mm-hmm. yeah. it can happen and it will happen. Yes. Mm-hmm. And I won't put a number on it, but it will happen. <laughs> see, see, but, but this is my job as the moderator and the reporter. Are we talking 2024, 2028? <laughs> I, I need you to be specific. Happen. And then I would just add uh, this to uh, it is we have to create the environment for us to That's see right. a woman, a woman of color and black woman. Um, right. The current vice president. And then also we're all political. Si- well, Kelly's really a political scientist. <laughs> yeah. But we all you know, study the, 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 the American politics. And mm-hmm. so when you talk about a blueprint, the current vice president has the shortest runway um, uh, as it relates to a next election. And mm-hmm. so I would say that one of the things we've always said about um, Kamala Harris is she sits, her superpower is her intersectionality, right? Mm-hmm. She stands in the spirit of uh, Maya, Angela's, Maya Angelou's poem that says, you know, I come as one and I stand as 10,000. And so the question is, is this country ready um, to um, understand the importance of a di- the, di- the, the diversity that comes from a woman, a woman of color, mm-hmm. seeking the highest office? Um, and so that's the work, is for us to create the environment so that my little God, six-year-old godchild knows she can be anyone in this American mm-hmm. politic that she wants to be. And so as I think we close this out, I do want to get your closing thoughts as we look to those greater opportunities and and what you see as the possibilities that exist for black women running in 2022 and beyond. So again, we'll just have you close out with your final thoughts on that topic. Yeah, maybe we'll go in reverse. We'll yeah. start with Mignon. <laughs> you know, I like to listen to everybody else. It's the joy of going last. You know, I'm really excited, and I think I just try to live in a world of optimism, especially as it relates to black women and everything that we have overcome in our lives. And I'm optimistic about our future, especially in politics. I look at some of the women that are running. I look at a lot of the women that are whole lo- local offices. And who would have thought that the mayors that we have right now would be presiding over a country where we had to shut down COVID, a country where we saw a racial reckoning with George Floyd, but they did it with outstanding character and their cities are still moving and thriving. Of course, we all have problems because we tend to get all the problems, but I don't think we wake up saying we won't get the answers to the problems. So I think the more the merrier, and I think we're gonna be here, we are here to stay and we're gonna, we're gonna have more black women. Just wait and see. Um, I'm just going to say 2022 is definitely a year to watch. Mm -hmm. If anybody is familiar in here with a a 
a great lady whose name must be mentioned when we're talking about black women in politics, and that's Latasha Brown. That's right. Yes. And her immaculate ground game Absolutely. already put the incumbent governor of Georgia, Brian Kemp, on notice that we are coming for you in 2022. Mm -hmm. So watch what black women do in 2022. I wish we could predict it. We don't have that kind of crystal ball. But if someone like Latasha Brown says we are coming for you in 2022, something's going to change. Right. Yeah. I think 2022 is going to be so exciting. The fact that we already have so many black women declared to run for office. Mm -hmm. But overall, I just think the future is bright. You know, Mignon talked about young women. Mm -hmm. But what I really love about this new generation of young black women who want to run for office is they're just not waiting for anyone to ask. That's they're true. not waiting for permission. They're just stepping up and doing it. And it also goes back to why representation is so important. Mm -hmm. The fact that they are seeing the Ayanna Presleys, the Stacey Abrams, like real black women who have real lived experiences. They didn't have super easy lives. Mm -hmm. And now they're leaders in this country. So I'm just excited to see what black women are going to continue to do. I think, you know, in the conversation about uh, a black woman president, one of the things that came up for me is making sure that we remember the lessons we learned in previous elections. And I think 2020 gave us some lessons learned about uh, sexism and racism mm -hmm. on the campaign trail. Um, we have a handy report that we did at the Center for American Women in Politics um, called Tracking Gender in Election 2020. It's a nice timeline that gives you all the examples mm -hmm. of the ways in which I would say we failed, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we have to look backward to look forward and remember and not repeat some of the mistakes that we've made. And then I think black women have shown up and continue to show up in every election, and it's time for everybody else to show up mm -hmm. um, in support and in backing in ways, again, that are really substantive. And if we do see that support, whether it be financial, whether it be you know helping with mobilizing votes, et cetera, pushing back against voter suppression issues, whatever it may be, that that will create the conditions for these women who are running to have success. Yeah. And to end where we began, um, the Center for American Women in Politics and Higher Heights Leadership Fund, our work is to present black women lead by the numbers. So black women have proved proof of concept over and over again. And so I believe that 2022 is not only continuing to see our numbers rise, right, um, but it is also at the end of the day, we want to change the makeup of decision making tables. When you have diverse decision-making tables, they make better decisions. And the, the, the types of women, black women, that run for office, we are come with our lived experiences, but we come from different backgrounds. We're teachers, we're nurses, we're social workers, we're business leaders. Um, and those lived experiences are the types of uh, leaders we want at the decision-making tables when we are moving out of some of the toughest times of our nation and mm -hmm. the globe. Well, as they say, onward. So with that, we want to thank you, everyone who joined us, both again in person and online. Uh, we encourage you to take a closer look at the report, Reaching Higher Black Women in American Politics. And again, we want to give a special thank you to all of our panelists for their expertise, their insight, their wisdom, uh, and much more. <laughs> so we want to give a round of applause to our, our panel.